Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thank you for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And we're privileged today to be joined by Dr. Carmen Rojas, who is the president of the Mar Marguerite Casey Foundation based in Seattle. Uh, Carmen is one of the leaders in philanthropy in the United States, is doing a lot of creative work, particularly in the area of workers' rights and social justice. Carmen, it's great to have you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, John. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Great. Well, Carmen, I've seen a couple of your talks on, on YouTube, and uh, when asked to sort of describe what animates your work, you so oftentimes uh, start with the story of your parents and how that, um, you know, a sort of a miraculous story that has provided both kind of inspiration and focus to your career. So tell us a little bit about your parents' journey to the U.S. Yeah, um, so my mom is the second eldest of 17 kids from a small town in Nicaragua, and my dad is uh, the youngest of 10 um, from a small island in the Caribbean off the coast of Venezuela. And they both immigrated in the late 60s, um, really looking for a, a opportunity. Um, uh, both Nicaragua and Venezuela were experiencing political and economic turmoil, uh, and they both came from poor families. And so really wanting um, to expand the aperture of what was possible for themselves and for their family. And so they met in San Francisco, and my mom, uh, my mom's story is for me really special. Um, for a whole host of reasons. Like she uh, immigrated, started working, uh, um, sewing clothes at a Levi's factory in San Francisco, had a job cleaning office buildings, and one day was uh, at one of the office buildings that my godmother uh, worked at. They were hiring entry-level tellers, um, and my mom applied for a job and got it, uh, and it, she went um, from cleaning the building to working in the building Thing, but something more meaningful happened in that shift, right? Like she got a job at a national bank that offered all of its entry level employees no interest loans to buy their first homes. And so my mom, um, with a middle school education, was able to um, come to this country, get a job at a time. Uh, largely because the civil rights movement, the labor rights movement, the feminist movement had made really tremendous gains for people like my mom. Uh, my mom was a real beneficiary. We are beneficiaries of the social movements that preceded her arrival. And so uh, that her arriving at this time, her getting this job, uh, really transformed my economic reality. My parents owned a house in San Francisco that could then lead to them selling that house and buying a house somewhere else in the Bay Area. We went from um, really uh, economically unstable to a pretty stable uh household, which is tremendous. My dad went from, you know, uh, washing dishes in restaurants to becoming a union uh, truck driver. And that equally uh, helped our family, uh, like speak or breathe life into what is often called the American dream. Um, it really helped them realize it. Well, let's uh, we'll come back to some of these themes, but in, ter in terms of your own growth and development, you then, I mean, you grew up in, I think, San Jose. You went to college at the University of California, Santa Cruz as an undergrad, and then Cal Berkeley for graduate school. And I think you, you've studied politics, and then for your PhD, it was pu public planning. Tell us about your sort of intellectual journey. What sort of animated your interest and got you excited? Yeah, I, you know, I consider myself a student of Latin American social movements. Like I have always, I was really lucky. Um, UC Santa Cruz at the time that I went there had the highest number of tenured faculty of color, as well as the richest, whitest student body. So there was a gap. If you were a student of color, you had the opportunity to work with some of the leading scholars in this country studying all kinds of things. And I just um, happened to... Uh, 
be most attracted to those scholars studying social movements. So I uh, did work uh, looking at human rights violations in women's prisons in the United States, spent a lot of time looking at Black women's social movements in Latin America, and was always really interested and curious uh, about the ways that social movements are uh, contests for power. Uh, and eventually went to city planning because city planning is like a, is such an interesting field. Most city planners in the United States, but actually also globally, are setting the norms and terms in which people live. Everything from housing to roads, how we invest money in cities is often determined by city planners. But city planners are often, I can you just hold on one second? Sure, I'm go so ahead. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, very flexible I, I, here, recent, <laughs> I recently moved. There's like a whole lot of other information, but I recently moved, uh, and so um, I'm in the in the moving in the in the state of the art movies. I really appreciate your patience. I appreciate your patience. Sorry about that. No problem. No. You're, you're talking about city planning and how that. Oh yeah. Uh, um, and so for me, the city planner is like the most interesting, powerful person that nobody ever thinks to go knock on their door to ask for the resources they need in order to meet their housing needs, to have access to public transportation, to figure out where the supermarket or jobs are going to be in their city. And so I've always been uh, the relationship both between social movements, people contesting for power, and city planners, people who are seem to be benevolent or innocu innocuous power holders has always fascinated me, right? Uh, and trying to figure out those ways that these relationships are created, as well as how we shift them, right? So how do we expand the ways that um, people who don't have power do have them? What are the participatory practices that we need to take into account when we build our cities that are important? How do we think about things like you know, the call today to cancel rent, right, as a practice of city making and city planning um, have always been really important and um, like my oxygen, really, the, the, of what's possible when we um, not only see power, but we fight to shift power in service of those that don't have it. And so when you finished up, were you inclined to go into city planning or how did you make the, the move into philanthropy? What was this? Yeah, sort of I, um, I did my dissertation work looking at the informal uh, economy in Venezuela under Chavez. Uh, and so was fully a Latin Americanist, but it spent the vast majority of my time in school actually studying, uh, actually working outside of the university. So um, when I went away to do my field work, it was the first gap of time where I was full, like a full-time academic. And um, I came, I, like, I butted a, against a number of tensions. One is this feeling um, of being, not being from a place, but studying a place and not being accountable to people in that place. So studying Venezuela, not being from Venezuela, and always being reminded that I could get in and get on an airplane with my U.S. passport uh, at any moment in time and leave the context that I was in was really troubling for me. It was also uh, during Obama's first election, and so was really excited about the, like many people were at that moment, uh, about the possibility of that election. And so made a decision when I finished that I actually wanted to get a job. And um, uh, prior to leaving to do my field work, I uh, had an opportunity to work for the mayor, who was now the uh, governor of California, but then was the mayor of San Francisco, looking at black displacement uh, in the city of San Francisco. And one of the people on the task force worked at a foundation and they were hiring. And so um, for me, philanthropy really represented this um, invisible power uh, that often sets the norms uh, by which uh, we allocate resources and contest for the norms of our society that nobody knows to call out until recently. I mean, I think now we're seeing more and more uh, work and critique of philanthropy, but then 
for the longest time, I think, uh, outside of the NPR <laughs> commercial break of who is sponsoring this segment, um, very few people thought about the ways that philanthropy uh, creates an audience uh, as opposed to uh, uh, investing in leaders to actually shift power. And you, I know this is moving ahead a little bit, but you then, um, some years later, were, was one of the co-founders of the Workers Lab. Tell us about the inspiration for that and, and just really how it worked in a practical sense. Sure. So the Workers Lab was um, and is still uh, meant to be a place where we could start to create uh, a meaningful contribution about what building power for working people uh, truly looks like uh, in the 21st century economy. I feel like, like I mentioned my dad was a teamster, so I come out of a union household, a labor tradition, and we were seeing the economy shift in ways that uh, labor unions, that neither labor unions nor worker centers were actually being effective at shifting who had access to capital to be able to change the norms in the workplace to change the norms uh, of how capital flows, but also to change the norms of our economy so that um, uh, profit isn't contingent on m killing people. Like we're living in a moment where profit, literally pe billionaires are becoming even greater billionaires uh, uh, because people, working people specifically are being exposed. So the workers lab was m really meant to be a place to um, do a couple of things. One, um, make the gains that were available to mostly white workers in the 20th century available to all workers, the set of protections, um, the set of benefits, the ground in uh, wages and salaries. Um, so this whole universalizing the benefits in the 20th century was a big thing. I think the second was like introducing new ways of doing business thinking about profit not as like um, an endeavor to ma maximize extraction, but also, but possibly an endeavor to create a uh, greater equality of access to resources, sort of to level the playing field of who not only made money, but who governed and who set the norms in work. Uh, and so creating some room for that. For me specifically as a woman of color, I, I was really interested in how the innovation space specifically was um, given away to mostly young white tech bros. That like the space to innovate, the space to imagine, the space to create, the space to fail uh, was a space that was wholly occupied by white men. And so I wanted to create a space for people of color, for women of color, for queer people of color to be able to, um, to dream and to try new things and not feel like trying something and it not working out was going to be detrimental to the rest of their career, that these resources were really meant to be lab resources, right? The, uh, the types of resources that allow people uh, to explore, to like reach the edges of what their imagination tells them that what's possible. And frankly, like maybe not solve the problem, but help shed some light on some possible solutions. Are there a couple examples that kind of quickly come to mind about just exemplifying the best of what the lab was able to do? Yeah, yeah, there are um, on both sides. It was like some things that I'm like, oh, could keep me sometimes wake me up and some things that were really amazing. Um, so like one of the things that, one of the last things that we did uh, uh, before I left was we ran a design sprint. Uh, it was at a time when universal basic income was really front of mind for a number of people. And we wanted, I've always been concerned that universal basic income starts to create a, um, uh, a way to shift resources away from the state actually providing benefits from an actual safety net to uh, actually being able to uh, try to essentially get make the a false choice between care and cash like either you have access to medical benefits or food or a quality education or we'll give you a check and then you can pay for it on your own that felt like a false choice to me uh, and so 
uh, we wanted to do an experiment or where we realized that people just needed cash, right? Like that UBI as an idea was really exciting to people because we saw that um, uh, so many people were essentially $400 away from like living on the streets from extreme poverty. And so we ran an experiment where we got a number of companies, companies that you would not expect, gig companies to pay into a benefit that workers made, had available to them whenever they wanted, and they could get $1,000. And what I thought was fat, what I loved about the experiment was that one, we got companies to pay. And that, that was actually the easiest thing. Two, that when I would actually talk to funders about it specifically, there was a way in which we started um, to accept uh, the ways that poor people are pathologized, right? So like the first set of questions were always like, so how do you know that they're not going to use the money to buy dr alcohol or to buy drugs? And I was like, well, who, who am I to I buy alcohol with, <laughs> with my money? Like, who am I to say one, uh, but to it, like really, um, brought to the forefront, the disconnect between people who fund uh, work meant to build power for poor people and poor people and their lives, right? Like there was a, a number of funders really accepted a pathology of poverty of what it meant to be poor that we then got to disrupt. Um, and then lastly, it's like just frankly, like the ability to get people money and to talk to them about what it meant to their day to day lives. So um, we ran the experiment in four cities. It was the largest cash transfer experiment in the country at the time. Um, and the things that were striking were a number. People had up to $1,000. Almost across the board, people would ask for an exact amount. Everybody had a bill that they wanted to pay. Like there was no like, I can get this much, I'm going to get the full amount, which is I think a way that um, a belief that many funders had of the project. But the second thing and the most, um, something that I carry with me actually into this job was when we do these interviews with people, they could always call out the moment in time, like the decision in their life that led them to being poor and working. So um, they dropped out of high school, they had a kid too young, a parent passed away, um, and it really, uh, for me, uh, showed how effective this neoliberal logic of self self determination of of people of people making one choice and that relegating them to a life of working poverty has been so normalized so much so that people can't point at the systems and people in power who are making choices to keep them poor, but instead that they can point to them like the minutia of their day to day. Uh, existence that we all make false, bad choices all the time. <laughs> we all do. It's just that the vast majority of working people in this country pay a huge penalty for those choices. And so it was really helpful as a, uh, as a reminder of the norms, of the stories that we tell ourselves about uh, who is deserving and who is undeserving, the way we accepted for a whole generation the idea that you know, working poverty, like that that's a thing in this country is idiotic and absurd, but it really, hearing the pain that that um, uh, placed onto people's back, like the burden of that, hearing that, hearing their stories of that moment in time really uh, made me want to double down my commitment on targeting the victors, the people who benefit by keeping working people poor, and to calling them out uh, and calling out the systems, right, um, that keep working people poor uh, as uh, critical to shifting and transforming who has power in our economy. Well, I saw you at a conference, I, I think you, you sat on the board of the Marguerite Casey Foundation, and I saw you at a conference say when the chance to become president uh, presented itself, it was, you know, a dream job, a dream opportunity. What, what, wh why did you make the move? Tell us a little bit about the foundation and what you're yeah. allowed to do that particularly excites you. Yeah, well, there's money. So there's like, just like the honest thing of, you know, I'm no longer raising money and there is money to give out. Uh, and in this moment, you know, on my first, in my first month, 
we made almost 120 grants to organizations across the country who were uh, on the front lines of responding to COVID-19. Uh, after the murder of George Floyd, we made you know a quarter million dollar grants to or Black the Movement for Black Lives organizations in Kentucky and Tallahassee, uh, in St. Louis, which is just powerful. Um, uh, I think the, you know, so one is like the obvious, <laughs> when you have money, it's pretty amazing. When capitalism works for you, it does really work. Um, uh, and I don't like to be Pollyannish and uh, bury the lead when it comes to that. I think secondly, like our institution is really unique, right? Like we have no tie to an existing family member. Our, our board is, um, I would argue, one of the most diverse boards of any foundations in the country. We have one white person on our board, which is unheard of in philanthropy, and also experientially diverse. So we have everybody from um, the person who manages uh, Wisconsin um, pension fund to uh, Melody Barnes, who was President Obama's domestic policy advisor as my board chair. So it's like also a real range of experiment, experience, all with a true commitment to the families and communities at the center of our mission, right? So every single person on our board is clear that we need to shift power in this country in order for people to be uh, live better lives, for them to have more opportunity, for them to have greater mobility. And so for uh, me, the opportunity was stepping into an institution that um, was already doing the experimentation that philanthropy lends itself towards, um, that it was doing so unabashedly. So we only do general operating support. We don't have program areas. You know, you apply for a grant from us and you can use that money for whatever you see fit. And uh, I think that my predecessor had a real commitment to making sure that leaders felt free. Uh, and that general operating support is that. She never, she wasn't like, did you buy printing paper? Or did you write that report? It doesn't matter, like you need both of those things are equally as important. And somehow philanthropy has um, uh, sort of like such, created such a tight box around our leaders, wanting them to solve some of the most complex problems in our society, that it, there seems to be, um, yeah, a conflicting commitment. There seems to be a conflicting commitment between wanting to solve uh, complex problems in audacious ways on the one side and on the other side, uh, wanting to see a report produced or wanting to see a victory in six months or wanting to see like, um, tangible gains uh, in a system that has been built over hundreds of years. And I think that that's, uh, it's like a tough call. So Marguerite Casey for me really represented an opportunity to take the things that I've learned uh, in building Workers Lab uh, and um, frankly throughout my career and to start to reimagine what it looks like to truly invest in uh, the brightest leaders in this moment, reshaping who's represented in our democracy and our economy. Well, in the conference I, I saw you uh, speak at in, in June, you talked about the urgency of the moment. And you said this is a historic moment, a, a, a pivotal time. De define what you mean by that. Um, I think that there's just an ideological opening in this moment, right? Um, I come from a, uh, uh, feminist, abolitionist, um, uh, like a, a group of freedom scholars, people who for years and years, for decades, have been working on um, uh, dismantling the prison industrial complex. In January, had we gone to the vast majority of people in this country and said, are the police a problem? The vast majority of them would have said no. Um, uh, especially the vast majority of white people in this country. The ideological opening right now is that uh, we are starting to see the ways in which police and the carceral state have come at the expense of the freedom of uh, immigrant communities, black communities, indigenous communities. Uh, and there's now a real interest and appetite to figuring out what's next. 
uh, to uh, putting something on the table that has been so core to our founding as a country. Um, I always tell the story about my mom uh, specifically uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because I think that there's a way in which we narrate American history so that that story is the norm. And I want to remind people that it's, the not, it's not the norm. Like she, she came at like in this sliver in time, right? Uh, and that the vat, we've lived more years uh, segregated and in slavery than we've lived integrated. Like it's like with a true policy of integration, those are just numbers, that's like true. Um, but if you heard the story that we tell ourselves, uh, about our history, I think we uh, are a bit delusional. Uh, and stories like my mom's can either add, lend themselves to the, the delusion or um, demonstrate what it looks like when we are at our best. Uh, and so for me, this moment is an opportunity to be our best, to imagine a place where we can keep each other safe. Uh, and we don't need uh, people with guns to do traffic stops, where we don't need people with guns uh, with months of training uh, to address mental health or housing issues. Uh, we don't need uh, people with guns to, you know, uh, be in our schools. Like we are in a moment, for my whole life, the police have been a, a, a huge uh, shadow in in my in in how I live, right? Um, I have brothers of color. I have uh, cousins of color. I've come from a really uh, majority Latino community, uh, and the police were never. I never felt safe. Um, I always felt unsafe. Uh, and we are at a moment where I can say that, and people don't look at me like I'm crazy. Uh, and I think that that's a, such an important uh, this moment. Uh, is one where I think we have an opportunity to put on the table things that many people have taken for granted. And instead of asking ourselves a question like, how do I feel? Do I feel safe? Uh, we have an opportunity to ask, how do we feel? Uh, do we feel safe? Uh, is this working for us? Uh, in a way that just has not been, I just, it's, it's never been on the table, John, in the way that it is today. A couple uh, months ago, Carmen, we had a really thoughtful state representative from Illinois, uh, Chris Welch, talk, and it was in the context of the defund the police debate and issue. And he made the point, he said, I am for fundamental reform of policing, but if I use that term, I'm going to end up alienating people who I think I can ultimately bring along with me and do some really important things. Are you sympathetic to that perspective, or do you think you need to use the sharpest, most focused language possible? I, I mean, I, uh, two things. Uh, I think his job is different than my job. Uh, I think he does, as a public servant, need to figure out how to move as many people as possible to a place where they have a true understanding of the impact of policing on our communities. So uh, that's different than my job. My job is a truly liberatory job, right? Like when philanthropy talks about risk capital or pragmatism, it's crazy. Like I don't have to make widgets. I don't have people in a factory that are producing things and stuff. It's my job to create a strategy and then invest in a set of leaders to help um, uh, animate and create and realize that strategy uh, with the greatest impact on the families at the center of our mission. And so it is my job to say the most audacious thing. I can. It should be my job. It should be my job to, um, all I can think about is like shooting a bow all the way to the farthest point so we know where land ends and the ocean begins, right? Like, um, uh, it is my job. And, and I think that in that case, we, him and I have different jobs. Um, and I also think we have to be honest. Uh, I, I think that a lot of what I find really troubling about the conversation about reform is that it's often organized uh, around this idea of a few bad apples. Uh, and it's um, policing in this country has its DNA in slavery in the Jim Crow South. 
in the policing of black people in the north it's like it, there's no there's not one moment in which policing act as acted as a um, uh, a leveling force or a justice force instead we have all of this evidence a huge a huge history a long history of evidence in which policing was contingent on controlling black people uh, and so I think it's his job to say that honest truth and it's been contingent on controlling black people to the benefit of white people and that is also an honest truth that i think we have to be able that he has to say and that i have to say but who needs to be uh, organized or brought along um we have different we have different constituencies i'm like an enabler uh and he is a uh um a creator you know i wish i could uh, i feel i know we have different roles uh and usually i'm really good with these little with these little quips <laughs> but uh, yeah <laughs> but you, so you see them as complementary roles that you are sort of you know providing a context where he can step forward and make ultimately practical agreements that move significantly in the direction you want to go Totally. I mean, I think it's our job as an institution to support those organizations and leaders that are holding him accountable, that are organizing and saying, yeah, great reform. And let's not forget all of these things. Right. So like, um, I think it's, um, it should always be a, it should always be like a tense relationship, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a complementary tense relationship in service of the public good. Um, Unfortunately, with the policing conversation, the, the consequences are so great. People are being killed every day. Yes, like every day. Uh, and it's, that's unacceptable that I use my tax dollars in service of arming somebody in my city to kill somebody else or to hurt somebody else. That's, um, I don't wanna make that choice. And I don't want my elected officials to make that choice either. And so as a leader in philanthropy, I think it's my job to support those folks who are organizing people in communities across the country to say, no, that's enough. And like, uh, we actually could use these resources for so many other things. It's amazing to me that defunding the police is such a provocative statement, but defunding schools is not, or defunding health care centers are not, are not or defunding, um, bus systems are not like we defund all the time and the ways that defunding the police has become so ra such a radical call is um for me so telling about the ways that we've accepted policing and again specifically the the policing of black people as a necessary norm for our democracy and i just reject it Let's talk a little bit about COVID and, and what it has wrought. And I, I was reading an article uh, recently in Vox, the, uh, the online news service. And it, it, I want to read a sentence or two because it, it, the, the author says, you know, initially COVID was thought of an equalizer, but then she writes, but with every day that goes by, it becomes more clear that the virus isn't an equalizer at all. Instead, it is exacerbating the inequalities in American society, taking a disproportionate toll on low income Americans people of color and others who are already marginalized before the crisis hit. React to that. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I mean, I think that the, even the early notions that COVID, that anything in the United States could ex be experienced without the, um, the lens of race and class is absurd. Uh, anything, nothing like, um, if you have money and if you're white in this country, if you're a straight white person with money in this country, um, uh, your life is pretty good compared to everybody else. Um, and if you live at the intersection, if you live at the center of that Venn diagram, your life is pretty great. Uh, and you have access to healthcare, you have access, that just the sheer access, you know, um, I'll speak for myself, right, as a Latina who now has this job and now has, you know, a house and money, like the things that I have access to, um, I could never have imagined, never, like the, ab the ability to see a doctor whenever I feel like to look, call on the internet <laughs> and be like, I'm not feeling what, like the, uh, the vast majority of people that I grew up with, the vast majority of people in my family can't like the can't imagine that and that's the vast majority of americans like before covid before the economic crisis more than nearly half of americans were in less than nineteen thousand dollars a year 
that's crazy. That's like a crazy, that, I just can't even imagine. And that, that um, anything would be experienced uh, assuming that Jeff Bezos and a frontline McDonald's workers would be having the, would be confronting the same turmoil, um, I think was, is, was naive was naive early, was naive early on. And some people, I mean, a lot, number of people are still um, talking as if it's an equalizer, um, but in every facet, you know, from school access to school to access to care, like who, uh, who can actually sleep and like be at ease in this moment and who is really worried about their day-to-day -day life and existence. Um, is overwhelmingly uh, understood and experienced through a class and race, um, uh, through the lens of class and race. I, I also heard you say that you wanted to use your, your, your endowment, you, you said to use the full weight of it to advance the cause of racial justice. Tell us, I mean, in kind of a practical sense, what do you think? Totally. Yeah, so we're actively looking at everything from the ways that we can use our resources and support of things like municipal bonds to incentivize cities to make different choices and not just bring police in, but what are the what is the power of a municipal bond? Can we invest in municipal bonds in ways that put pressure, put a different pressure on city government? Um, Mayor Carter of St. Paul, Minnesota once told me when I was at Workers Up, one of the last meetings that I had he told me the story of how when the federal government comes to give grants around uh, policing, there's often like a, there's a hook. It's like, we're going to pay for the police. We're going to pay for a hundred new police for the next two years, but you have to pay for them for the next three years. And if you don't pay them, then you have to pay us back the money with interest. And since it's seen as like an upfront free, like an upfront freebie, a number of cities will take that. Uh, not calculating the long-term expense. Imagine doing the same exact thing, but for um, public education or public transit or public libraries or public anything, right? Like uh, imagine creating an environment where our city leaders actually have the room to invest in the services um, that, that make people's lives better and using philanthropic dollars in one way to be able to do that. I think the other way is, not only investing in managers of color, uh, uh, but also investing in managers of color who uh, are actually building and creating solutions to some of the pressing problems that communities of color are facing. Everything from uh, affordable housing development um, to products and services where we know uh, communities of color are often underserved and thought of, you know, are the last people thought of in the development of new medical, environmental, uh, personal uh, products and services. I saw a, a comment from Congressman Castro the other day, and he's, he was talking about just the, the uh, really the coalition with um, the Latino community and the African American community. But he said, um, there's no doubt that the African American community has borne the biggest brunt of police brutality, but it's also clear that Latinos have suffered as well. There's a kinship of experience. Reflect on that. Yeah, um, yes. <laughs> there is a kinship of, kinship of experience. And I think the thing that's often, two things that are often not talk, talked about is that there are a, a, a good number of Black Latino people. <laughs> that Latinos aren't a race, you know? Latinos come like me and we come in all colors. Uh, and so I think that um, one of the things that's missed in this moment is uh, the the ways that we have invisibilized Afro-Latinos uh, as, as a group, as a really important group creating and setting political norms in our, in our country. And I think for me uh, as a Latina, one of the things, as a non-Black Latina, one of the things that I'm always um, holding front of mind is, um, I, I think the way that communities of color are sort of pit against each other is is fascinating um, at its best and deeply troubling. And it's mostly trying to tell a story about how 
more recent immigrants have been able to win or gain the system. So I could have easily told you the story of my mom and I could have been like, well, you know, like she just kind of worked really hard and she really did make it, didn't she? Like that's really, look at, this is what happens when you work really hard and you really did make it. I am clear that the gains that my mom made, she made because a group of black people in the South fought for civil rights. I, I, um, I am clear that when black people in this country are free, that Latino people will be free, native people will be free, Asian Pacific Islander people will be free, poor white people will be free. I don't, um, it doesn't feel like a, it feels like a false choice to say like, um, uh, these are even endeavors because history has told us that they're not, that, uh, uh, people in power will find ways to pit us against each other at our own detriment and overwhelmingly black people suffer. Uh, and I think it's important that as people of color, we are honest about that and uh, have a more sophisticated analysis about the history of this country such that we are um, leading. I feel no shame and it doesn't it like, uh, it feels so true to me that uh, the freedom of people in my community is so tethered to the freedom of black people. So I'm going to work for the freedom of black people uh, in any role that I have to the greatest of my ability because I'm clear uh, of what history has taught us that like, um, uh, yeah, when black people are free, we're all free. Uh, when black people have rights, we all have rights. We're all better off. It's just, um, we have such so much evidence of this. Okay. Well, Carmen, we have a couple questions people have emailed in that I'd like to to oh, sure. uh, to to pose. One is from Sarah from a town called Tolona, Illinois, and she said, "What can universities do to address these racial inequities, um, other than a, directing CARES Act money to financial aid?" And she adds, "What can cities and municipalities do to help?" Yeah. Um, uh, I think that in this moment, uh, we need to be able to talk about, I say this often, like the victims and the victors, right? Like that racial injustice isn't something that happens in a vacuum, that there are people who are profiting from racial injustice, there are people who are gaining political power from racial injustice. I think universities are no different, cities are no different. And so being able to uh, name who, who wins, uh, because white supremacy is a norm in our country. Who wins and benefits uh, because um, black people are killed by the police. There are like, there are clear winners in this system. And so across the board, I've been trying to hold um, myself accountable to naming both the victims and the victors of racial justice so that it's an even picture. So it's um, not, uh, something that comes, it's not something that's normal or that's like in the air. It's a set of choices that our leaders are making to live into and that we have the opportunity to live into a whole different set of choices. Okay. Uh, Patty from Creel Springs, Illinois, uh, poses a question of, of, of whether you believe the media is exaggerating the scope of civil unrest and racial tensions in the U.S. Oh, I think that they're under reporting. <laughs> I don't, I don't think the media is, uh, if I under, if I under, yeah, if I understand the question correctly, um, uh, I think that there's an under reporting of, for every story that you see of a black person being killed by the police within the next week, you'll see like a whole host of stories of, um, uh, mixed race kids who really like each other. White policeman goes into black neighborhood and there's a dance off um like there's like all of the these subsequent stories that try to create the illusion that these are um n even though they happen consistently right like we in the last five years we have seen so many people so many black people killed at the hands of the police but we have in between each of these stories it hasn't been contiguous, like the media hasn't been like, oh, look at this. We're like rolling up into a whole, uh, there seems there's something happening here. And instead, there's a, a real desire uh, to create some balance 
But that balance comes at the expense of the truth that, that Black people are being killed. Uh, and so I don't think that it's overblown. And I actually would argue that um, uh, it's the opposite, that there's a lot of underreporting that's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, what is your, as you look to the, the coming year or so, what is your most hopeful scenario or, or beyond the year? I mean, what can come of this moment? What is your most uh, hopeful and optimistic scenario? Yeah, you know, so uh, defund the police is a really powerful, um, it's a powerful clarion call. And behind it is this idea of divest to invest, right? So like, it's not just take money out willy nilly, it's take money out and put money into places that we know we need it. Put money into building housing, put money into social services, put money into our schools and transportation networks, right? Um, I'm really excited about the ways that uh, leaders and organizations are seeing this as a clarion call, as well as creating plans for the reinvestment that um, uh, that we believe in us, right? And want to put resources where uh, that will make us in places that will make us all better. Uh, I'm really excited about that. I'm excited uh, about the power of, you know, I'm a new person to Seattle and Seattle is a very white place compared to where I come from. And I've been really uh, excited um, moved by the ways that white people have used and mobilized their agency and power and service of racial justice in this moment uh, in ways that they haven't in the past, uh, in ways that they haven't uh, sort of situated themselves as beneficiaries of white supremacy. I'm seeing more clearly, like there's just more grappling that's happening. And, and I'm, uh, I'm very hopeful because I think that that brings us all closer together in a meaningful way. Um, I'm, a, but I'm, you should, I am, um, I like talk real negative talk <laughs> and I am naturally an optimistic person. I believe we're going to win. Uh, I believe in racial justice and I believe in economic justice and I know that we're going to win and it may be in my lifetime and it may not be, but I'm going to work as hard as I possibly possibly can because the belief feels so clear inside of my personhood. Well, if you were going to recommend a book or a movie or a documentary or some kind of, you know, work of art to, to sort of focus people on this issue, this moment, um, and even more broadly, just the challenge of the working class in the United States, what, do any ideas come to mind? Yeah. Um, uh, less the working class, maybe the working class. Um, the movie that I always go back to is, I think it may actually be on Netflix now or on Hulu or something. It's like uh, the Toni Morrison documentary, The Pieces of Me. Uh, Pieces of Me, I think that's the title of it. Uh, but it's just an amazing documentary. One, I'm a huge Toni Morrison fan. She, she was like one of the very first authors that I read that articulated the Black experience for Black people. Uh, it was not seeking to like situate Blackness within whiteness. It was like a Black intimacy, Black hate, Black uh, relationship, free from uh, anybody on the outside observing. And I think that that's like her storytelling is super powerful. But more importantly, Toni Morrison as a, I would consider like a, a beacon of light for so many social movement leaders in her time, right? Like she helped Angela Davis write her book. She helped Muhammad Ali write and publish his book. She like, she is, plays this figure um, of an enabling force for so many important people in American history without needing to be at the front. Like she is um, really like the, yeah, the enabling force, the enabling environment for Black stories. Uh, and I, so I go back to it because it reminds me of a role that I want to have, right? Which is uh, while I have this job with so much proximity to these resources, how am I creating room for people to lead in ways uh, that allow me to follow? Uh, and I think that she did it in an amazing way. And the movie is a really great example of that.
Good. Well, Carmen, it's the final question. In, I think 2016, you gave a TED talk and you, 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 the title was Joy, Love, Fun is Resistance. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and then uh, one of the, the comments you said, in resistance, we find joy. Elaborate on that. Yeah. Um, I think that there's uh, anything that you ever watch or read about social movements, any time you have an opportunity to talk to social movement leaders, the, um, there's a way in which we can think about struggle as like the only way to win. And I don't think that that's true. I think, uh, I often think Rashad Robinson, who runs Color of Change, talks about not only stating the facts and stating what is, but also creating opportunities for people to have hope, for people to laugh out loud, for people to fall in love and make new friends. Uh, that those things, those like very human things are also animating forces. They're drivers for us to create greater proximity to each other. And I really believe that, you know, like I don't, um, uh, because I'm an optimist, I'm always like leaning on those moments when I laughed out loud in the hardest, in the hardest times of my day. And so I just, um, I think joy is such an important thing that to remember, especially in hard times. Great, thank you. Well, Carmen, I know you spent most of your time in the West Coast. I, I, you mentioned yesterday you had lived in New York. So we would love when travel allows to get you to the Midwest and to visit us in Southern Illinois and meet with students and meet with community I would members. Love that. We would really love to have you here and to see you in person and have you uh, tell your story uh, in another context. Great, and thank you so much, John. Sorry, sorry for the, the comedy of errors, but I really appreciate your patience and I really appreciate this conversation. Great, well, thank you, be well, and we will see you soon. Thank you so Great. much. Great, thank and you. And thanks okay. everyone for watching another edition of Understanding Our New World. We will have this up on YouTube tomorrow. And thank you for following us on social media and supporting the Institute where we keep the legacy of Paul Simon alive and well. So thank you so much.